thank you for coming. Especially because this is sort of not the typical kind of number theory seminar I give. And I hope that I hope that we'll all come away from it agreeing that it was a number theory seminar, but that's uh something that's open for discussion. And um I, you know, also I should say in advance, because I already see in the list of participants like plenty of people who know a lot about both machine learning and number theory. So this is gonna be a somewhat like idiosyncratic talk about some stuff that I've worked on and sort of played around with. And it's certainly not meant to be uh, a complete view of the potential answer to this question. Um, maybe if I, maybe my goal will be, because I feel like there's plenty of people in our community who would feel that the answer to this question is nothing. And maybe my goal will be to try to at least make a sort of convincing argument that the answer is not nothing. And then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see where we get. Um, but let me start. Uh, it's always a question, an interesting question whether to start with the successes or start with the limitations. But let's, uh, let's, let me give an example to start with that's clearly number theory, right? We all agree that this is a central object that probably anybody who calls themselves a number theorist calls, uh, cares about to some extent the Mobius function so that basically tracks the parity of the number of prime factors of an integer, at least so long as it's square free um, and returns zero if a prime appears twice. And so this is a function and the magic of deep learning is supposed to be uh, that it's good at learning functions. Like it's supposed to be able to like somehow magically approximate any function and figure it out from some of its values. And so here's a function. Uh, let's ask ourselves what a neural net can do. Now, I'm not gonna um, I'm I'm not gonna sort of give any slides in this talk uh, about what a neural net is or how it works. I'm gonna sort of because I, I'm, I'm I'm trying very much to take a for the working mathematician approach in this talk. And so, um, let me tell you what kind of thing it is. Um, a neural net is something well, sort of the sort of the biggest the original applications were to image classification where you have a bunch of images and they're labeled, right? Like the first one's a cat, the second one is a faucet. The third one, uh, in many ways, it doesn't look that much like the first image, but it's also a cat. Um, and you can think of an image as just some point in a massive vector space, right? Capital N here should be thought of as the number of pixels uh, in this box, uh, and each pixel, I guess if it's a black and white picture, might have a real number attached to it, which is the brightness. And we might, you know, if we wanted some colors, we could jack up the dimension a little bit, but I'm just hiding all that in the capital N. It is whatever it is. Um, and then there's a function, but it's like a pretty simple function. It's a characteristic function. It just separates cats from non-cats or cats from, from faucets if everything in the world is a cat or a, or a faucet. Um, so that's, a function, um, but you, I mean, we, we can assert that there is some function like that, but it might be hard to compute it. But what we have is a bunch of that function's values because we have a bunch of pictures which are labeled as cats and a bunch of pictures that are labeled as non-cats. So it's like, you should think of this function as something where I'll tell you that, I'll give you a long list of vectors and say it sends these vectors to zero, these vectors to one, guess the function. And of course, you know, the entire theory of neural nets is 30 seconds is, of course, as mathematicians, we know there are lots of functions like that, right? You can't specify a function uh, by specifying a finite set of its values. Um, and then somehow what's going on is that there's some class of functions that you're drawing from um, or some dynamic process that, uh, that converges on among all the functions that have these values. Uh, the process somehow converges to one, which for some reason that I would say remains under theorized, uh, tends to generalize well and tends to sort of actually approximate the thing you want, at least for cats. It's like very good at cats at this point. So we can do that exact same thing. Um, and I don't mean this, I don't mean this abstractly. I mean, like literally when I was like, let me try to understand how this all works. There's like a Python package called PyTorch that you can just download and sort of take any function with some values and just like, Type it in and see what happens. So here's a function, pretty easy to compute in practice. Um, and I'll give you a lot of it. Now it's not a function from R to the 1 billion to zero or one, right? It's just a function from the integers. And you can give it a lot of values. You can say, okay, 17 goes to one, 15 goes to, oh, I wrote this wrong. Oh, great. Uh, so, uh, all right, sorry, 17 should be like, let's, oh, I have my pen so I can fix this. Um, I feel like when I gave this talk at ants, nobody mentioned this on this slide. Okay. Uh, 
At least I had this slide. Um, you can you can eat you can give the machine, you know, thousands of values of this, and then ask it, uh, what do you think this function is, and what does it what should it output when presented with some input that I didn't tell you what the answer was. Um, and here's what happens. Maybe I should have let you sort of wait and guess. What happens is, and this like what happened to me, I was like, this is not going to work. Machine can't learn the Mobius function. And then when I ran it, I was like, wow, this is getting much better than chance on Mobius. I was became in a moment uh, a neural net booster. But, and if there's people, I see there's people, some people in the participants who have some experience with this, maybe can guess what happened, but now I will tell you, because there's an important moral lesson in it. Um, when you actually look into this function that my machine had learned, here's what it here's what it learned. Mobius, remember, this is what the Mobius function is. The function my machine learned was if n is a multiple of four, output zero, and otherwise output a random number that's one or negative one. So that is actually a function that's decently correlated with Mobius, right? That will that will give you the right answer uh, much more frequently than giving a random number between zero, one, and negative one. And yet I think you'll all agree if we were like, wow, like a machine like learned to figure out the Mobius function, you'd be impressed. And if you were like a machine learned to figure out whether an integer was divisible by four, especially when given in binary, maybe, maybe you would not be so <laughs> amazed by this. So one lesson here is that yeah, you actually do have to kind of look at what you're doing and look at what you're learning rather than just relying on some abstract notion of um, of performance or correct predictions. In fact, let me say a little bit more about this because if you try a little harder, you know, give it more data, let it run longer, let it train longer, um, you can get it to not only learn divisibility by four, but divisibility by nine or divisibility by 25. And if you, and then this kind of long, still more time spent training is meant to indicate that I, I didn't actually get it to do this, but I sort of believe that if I had like the levels of compute that a major industrial actor had and were willing to like, you know, burn down an Ecuadorian rainforest or two, like I'm sure I could get it to learn divisibility by 49 as well. Um, but, so here's a philosophical question. There's probably some function of P, and again, under theorized, I have no idea what that, like how quickly that function would grow. Um, but I would, I would presume that you can get it to learn to return zero when N is a multiple of P squared. For any P given enough time, uh, you can learn that. And so what that means is that given enough time, let's already give up on the plus or minus one. Let's just say we're trying to learn the square of the Mobius function. We're trying to learn whether an integer is square free. Um, you can actually do that with a, if, in terms of percentage of correctness, a very high degree of precision. If you've learned to test for divisibility by the squares of the first hundred primes, you're going to get the answer mostly right when you answer, when you ask whether a number is square free or not. Um, but somehow, if you do this, you're going to get, as I said, the accuracy of your answer is going to be very near 100% if you train a long time. But from our point of view as mathematicians, the percentage of the concept that you've actually learned is 0%, right? Because you've learned 100 out of infinity primes that you need to test for divisibility by their square. So uh, this is a comment that's both supposed to be sort of somewhat indicative of sort of some of the challenges we face as we even try to answer, what do we mean when we say a machine has made progress on learning a mathematical concept? And then it's not sort of as simple as, um, is it tending to make correct predictions? So let me say, and if you want to see this uh, go in practice, because what I just showed you was like literally something I was doing in my house. So I want to emphasize like what I just told you, this experiment, you, any one of you could like literally do on your laptop. So there's no, there's nothing sort of forbidding you. And it, those who know me know that also that I am not a very good coder. So you, you don't have to be like particularly good at anything. Uh, in order to run experiments at this level. But obviously people who are much better at coding than me and have access to much more uh, resources than I do, like sort of do more serious things. So, I mean, um, this paper by Francois Charton, who is now a collaborator of mine, and I'll say a little bit about what we're working on uh, in a minute, um, 
So here's a paper, which is a link, which is a link to in the chat, uh, where you see with like a pretty powerful amount of compute getting pretty similar results. Here, the question that Francois was interested in is, can you learn the GCD of two integers? And very similarly, what you see is that with time, you can learn whether they have a common factor of P for sort of some small set of primes. And that small set of primes gets larger as you go. Unsurprisingly, uh, which primes it learns depends a lot on which base you give the number in. If you give it in base 10, it learns to, visit, it learns to find GCDs that are powers of two and five, like really, really fast, unsurprisingly. Um, but it learns three more slowly and seven more slowly than that, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, here's another, in some sense, maybe the structure of this talk, because I'm just gonna tell you like little life lessons I've learned about this kind of thing. For us, right, as number theorists, what base you express a number in is somehow not very important, right? That's something you think about when you do like high school math team problems or something like that. It's the same number, that shouldn't matter. Um, what we're gonna see, or what we discover again and again is that when you're trying to get a, a, a neural net or any other kind of machine learning architecture to do something, Okay, nobody look at what Michael Harris said in chat because he's stepping on my punchline for my next slide. Maybe I shouldn't have even said anything, then you wouldn't have looked at it. Okay, don't look at it. Um, right, but what, the point I'm making is that two presentations of the same input, which to us as mathematicians are so similar that you don't even really think of them as different, they can give completely different performance and completely different output for the machine. And once again, I'm just going to use the word under theorized constantly because I think that's something we don't understand very well. We don't understand like what's the right way to present uh, a certain kind of data to the machine. Although in this case, I think it's pretty clear, right? I think that if you're really motivated to learn GCD by powers of seven, like maybe base seven or base 49 or something like that is a, is a good base. Um, but this is a nice paper where you'll, you'll see sort of uh, the attempt to uh, solve a problem we would clearly consider arithmetic and sort of see exactly where the machine succeeds and where it fails. Okay, so as Michael points out in the chat, when we compute the GCDs of two integers and we're like, what's the right way to do this? We don't do it by trial division, right? Which is essentially what this machine is doing, learning visibility one prime at a time. Um, we do it by the Euclidean algorithm. And so, Here's a completely different take on the same problem. And this is the people you see uh, on the screen here are actually um, a group of undergraduate researchers who are working with me on this project uh, last year at Wisconsin, along with my grad student, uh, Karan Srivastava, who is uh, the first of my students working in this uh, math machine learning interface area. Um, and now here, so I have, so guys, I have a little bit of a multimedia mix where I have some slides that are just slides and some that are kind of blank where I'm just gonna write on. So. So the question is, can we learn the Euclidean algorithm? So, uh, so what do we mean by that? Well, I think of this as a problem of traversing a certain graph, right? Um, so you have a graph. Um, vertices are z squared and the moves are given by four matrices multiplied by either an upper triangular unipotence matrix or a lower triangular unipotent matrix. I mean, what I mean, that's just a fancy way of saying either you can add and subtract the first coordinate from the second, or you can add and subtract the second coordinate from the first. So these, of course, are the moves from which the things we're allowed to do in the Euclidean algorithm are drawn. Um, and the question is, can the machine learn which one to do? Again, for us, this is not very hard, right? We would look at this and say, well, probably you should make the move that makes your pair of integers smaller in some sense. Maybe it makes the max smaller or the sum of their absolute value smaller. And as a human, you would definitely, if you were given this much of a hint, right? Like this, I'm giving you this finite alphabet of moves you're allowed to use. You would be able to figure out which one to use to get yourself closer uh, to let's say zero one, if that's what you were trying to find. Um, so, so maybe I'm gonna say this another way. Um, 
So essentially the same as the Cayley graph of the group SL2Z with the with this symmetric set of four generators. So that's just like, you know, if instead of having an element of Z squared, you had a matrix with that first column and you were saying, okay, I give you some thick matrix and in the Cayley graph, I want to find my way home to the identity. That's sort of just like, it's the upside down version of saying, I want to express some matrix as a word in these generators. Maybe, maybe abstractly, you know that they generate the whole group. Um, but how do you actually do this in practice? And we know that this is like a real algorithmic problem, right? In, in, in group theory or in the case of arithmetic groups like this uh, in number theory. So here's the thing. I can just kind of airily say, can we get a machine to learn this? But this problem is not phrased in the kind of cat faucet kind of way. If this is a problem I'm supposed to be able to pass uh, to a machine, I somehow have to have some data to give it. Um, where am I going to get it? Well, in a case like this, and this is kind of different from cats and faucets, uh, we can just make the data. We can make what's called synthetic data. So let me show you. I think I have one more blank slide. So hopefully that's enough room. Um, so how to get training data. Well, here's one way to do it. Um, you can just do a bunch of random walks in this group. So, so do random walks in SL2Z with these generators. So you start at the identity um, and then you have, you know, some matrix gamma one, gamma two, you let this uh, walk run for a long time. You let it run for n steps. Um, and here's the data you store. You actually do this whole random walk and then you forget everything except the last two matrices. So, so remember the pair the last, the matrix you arrive at in your random walk, and then um, gamma n times gamma n minus one inverse, which has to be one of your four generators. That's the last step you took to get to the endpoint. So we can call this like endpoint last step. Uh, and then you might expect, well, if you reverse that, the last step is the way you got to the endpoint. So the inverse of the last step is your direction home along that random walk towards the origin. So what you may hope is that, okay, if I give you a bunch of pairs like this and say, from the endpoint, learn the last, learn the first step home. So last step equals inverse of first step home, maybe you actually learn to do the right thing. Um, and I, again, uh, not to give uh, any spoilers in the, in, in the link, there's a nice link to a write-up that Pramana wrote uh, about, uh, about their work on this project. Um, you actually can learn this like instantly, which maybe is not surprising because it's not very, once, once you, um, once I've given you this much information about the Euclidean algorithm, um, in fact, because this Cayley graph is almost a tree, um, this is, that data is almost certainly correct and the decision rule is like very simple, right? We know sort of that the rule for which thing you're supposed to uh, subtract from which other thing is just given by a linear boundary. Like if one of them is, you, you subtract the smaller one from the bigger one, that's what the Euclidean algorithm is. Um, so linear boundaries, they ought to be pretty easy for any kind of, uh, you don't need sort of like the latest and greatest in the neural net technology to learn a linear boundary, um, but it will learn that and it learns it very fast. So this somehow feels like a little bit more like learning GCD. Um, but let me say that all happened pretty fast. 
Oh, and let me get, let me show you a comment. This is actually for a slightly different problem, which I'm going to tell you about in a second. But um, this is a slide made by the students who I mentioned earlier. So you see there's four colors here. So don't worry about the label so much, but it's sort of telling you um, under what circumstances you're making each of the four choices. Um, and I want to emphasize that if you look at this, you're definitely like, okay, I see it's learning a learning. I, I see it's learning a linear boundary. I'm certainly, I'm seeing it's learning to do like one thing if one number is bigger than another and another if one number is bigger than zero or whatever. But if you look closely at it, you also see it's kind of ragged and it's not quite exactly along the line. And something kind of interesting happens, which is that if you actually take the Euclidean algorithm as their machine learns it and runs it, it's like somewhat unreliable. It does make bad choices some of the time. So in fact, um, this is a situation, and this kind of thing is not so uncommon, where, and I'm going to sort of tie this to the first thing I said with the Mobius function, where it's actually worthwhile to look at the function the machine is learning and see if you can figure out what is it actually doing. Same here, if you run this function, it's kind of unreliable. But if you look at it with your eye, you're like, okay, I can see it's trying to learn a linear boundary. Um, and then that function is exactly right. That is the Euclidean algorithm. So it, it, it clearly learns this. So... I'll just comment about sort of like ongoing stuff these guys are thinking about, which I think are quite interesting. Um, once you have this machine set up, you can do a random walk on any group in any set of generators you like. And one thing we quickly found is that it gets a lot, the machine gets a lot less good performance so far in almost any other situation. So for instance, I you know this famous sort of trichotomy of ways to walk in SL2Z. Um, so here's the example we just did. This is Euclidean algorithm. You could also use these matrices where you square those generators. So these guys, as you can see, they do not generate the whole of SL2Z, but they do generate a finite index subgroup. So they generate a finite index subgroup, uh, gamma of two. It's a subgroup of index six. Um, so here's what happens. It takes longer and it's a little more unreliable, but this will, if you run this thing, tell you um, how, if I give you a matrix in this subgroup, how to express it in the in a word in these generators. It's actually not so hard by hand to sort of figure out what an algorithm for doing that would be. And it does correctly learn that. One thing that's interesting that's maybe not so obvious is, remember, you're training it on random walks that because they're in these generators have to end up in this finite index subgroup. One thing that's cool about this case is that what happens if you then start with a matrix that's not in that subgroup? So this is something like you've never seen, right? Like that's, that's never been the endpoint of any... Um, of any random walk you found uh, in your synthetic data. Um, so I'll comment, which I, we thought was pretty interesting. If you start with gamma outside gamma two, it finds its way back to a coset representative. Well, I mean, of course, it has to stay in that coset because you're acting by those generators. My point is that there's some set of six coset representatives, and the thing that you trained to find your way back to the identity from something in the group, in fact, that same uh, decision procedure that it learns um, will pick out six distinguished sort of small coset representatives and like find its way back there. Um, what about, and then the third leg of this trichotomy is where you take the third powers of the generators, and now you're generating what's called a thin subgroup. It's a risky dense but infinite index. And here, so far, I'm going to be honest with you, uh, the machine gets totally confused. It's basically, it's, it's sometimes finding its way back when you're in the subgroup, but not always even that. And when you start outside the subgroup, it seems to just like, wander and get lost. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of questions here about, you know, 
as you may know, it's actually really hard. Like maybe maybe in SL2Z, it's more doable. But in general, it's like really hard to know if I give you sort of some set of matrices, what kind of subgroup do they generate? Is it infinite index? Is it finite index, et cetera? So I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done here to sort of figure out what kind of, uh, what kind of stuff is learnable and what is not. Um, but off the shelf, there's definitely some stuff that's not learnable. Um, so Jordan, maybe can I just jump yeah. in there? a couple of questions from the chat? So, oh, absolutely. Uh, there's a question from from Ralph Furman. Uh, this goes back a, a little bit in your talk, but uh, it says, instead of being given the two generators, uh, can it come up with its own linear transformation based on a goal of computing GCD after repeated iteration? So that's a great question. And I feel like my answer to all questions of this kind is going to be like, great idea, go try that because there's sort of an infinite amount of things to try. And like, um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe I should say that my original goal wasn't so much thinking about calculating GCD. It was because I'm interested in Cayley graphs of arithmetic groups and navigating them. And so I was sort of thinking of this at least at first as like a question about groups with a given set of generators, because I have in mind a given Cayley graph in which I want to like find my way uh, to the identity. Um, but you're right that that would be like a little more, uh, that would be yet another way of saying, what would it mean to learn the Euclidean algorithm? It would be very fair to say that I've gotten the machine like 90% of the way <laughs> to learning the Euclidean algorithm. And I'm asking it to sort of figure out the rest. Um, Great. And a question from Kevin O'Brien about, again, goes back a few minutes, but how are you measuring your performance? I mean, uh, holding back a chunk of your data? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we test, um, you know, we do lots of random walks, but like, you know, the, the, the volume ball of length N is like pretty big if N is at all large. So if you take a hundred steps, there's like a, those are end up pretty big matrices. And we certainly haven't seen all the matrices with entries around that size. And then of course you do things like, well, how does it work for matrices that you didn't train on that are around the same size as the matrices you didn't train on? But then also, how does it do for matrices that are much bigger than the ones you trained on, which in many cases is kind of uh, is kind of different. And uh, to Victor's question, now that I see it, because I actually specifically want to say that. So Victor asks about the word problems in like other kind of groups, like Coxeter groups. And I'll just say like one thing that's very cool is that when I was uh, visiting CMSA at this program I put a link to, um, I discovered that actually this is becoming kind of a popular problem by several independent groups, including Alexander Shevrov's group uh, in Paris. So this question of to what extent can we learn short paths in Cayley graphs of various groups, uh, including finite groups, uh, is a really interesting one. In a weird way, I think finite groups might actually be harder because like for this to work in SL2Z, like, I mean, you really need the notion of one element being bigger than another that you somehow don't really have. Uh, in other words, I think this problem is actually, in some sense, as, as you may know, the problem of finding short paths in the Cayley graph of SL2FP is actually quite a bit harder. You're, I mean, that's a um, those should expand, and you should be able to do everything in uh, on order log p. But to actually do it is not so easy. There's a great paper by Mike Larson um, about this. I mean, another way to put it, by the way, is look. Here's a good Coxeter group, like. The symmetric group on n letters, right? If you're sort of trying to find your way to the identity in there, that's sorting, right? You're asking, can I learn to sort? I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting problems that can be phrased this way. Um, okay, cool. Um, what am I going to say next? Ah, yeah, okay. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit because I want to kind of zoom out a little bit. But what this picture is looking at is this is a problem um that has become again kind of popular with like machine learning people i don't know if you'd consider it number theory or not i kind of do it's in this sort of realm of like additive number theory slash extremal combinatorics um so what this is a picture of is a set of 110 points in the 64 by 64 grid which and i'll be very impressed with your geometric intuition if you can detect without knowing what is special about this set of points but no three of them form an isosceles triangle I'm sure lots of you just saw that, right? Just like looking at these points. Well, no, it's not very visible. That's the point. And this is a nice question because, well, I don't know if this makes it nice or not nice, but if you ask how many points can I put in the N by N grid, um, 
So it's the no three form an isosceles triangle. Um, this is a problem which somehow mysteriously we think Erdős never posed. We can't figure out how it's possible that Erdős never asked this, but we've like really looked, and as far as we can tell, it's a completely Erdős-like problem, which is in the convex hall of Erdős problems, but may not actually be an Erdős problem. But it's a problem. Um, and what's crazy about this is, um, so in n by n grid. We know how to get on order n with no isosceles triangle. And even that is actually not so easy. And we know you can get at most little o of n squared, um, basically because like in each column, you have little o of n because three points in arithmetic progression are an isosceles triangle, and we have upper bounds for that. But that's a huge range, right, between n and n squared. And I think people don't really know like what the actual answer to this is supposed to be. Um, so this is like a kind of good candidate problem to uh, try to get a machine to do. I'm not going to tell you so much about how we do this. This is work in progress, which hopefully will be out pretty soon. There's a bunch of kind of problems in extremo combinatorics that we're sort of trying to get machines uh, to give good examples of. Um, the point I want to make about it, though, is that on the one hand, um, it gives you some information, like, I mean, it looks like at least the best the machine can do is certainly looks like linear and end. It's that maybe gives me sort of some kind of feeling that that could be a reasonable guess. On the other hand, much as I like this picture, I think we all agree, it doesn't really give you any insight into the problem. It's like dots in a box. So in machine learning land, like this is called like the, the problem of interpretability. Like you can look at this and it's a configuration and there's a lot of points in it and you could laboriously check by hand that there's no isosceles triangles. Um, but you're not necessarily getting new understanding of this problem from this process. Well, okay, you know, I said that, but maybe I should make one small correction, which is that at the very least, you can be like, boy, it looks like the points are kind of clustered around the boundary. That I think with your eye, you can see. And then I do, you can like, you can sort of then heuristically convince yourself it's sort of a fun exercise. Oh yeah, I see why if you were trying to avoid isosceles triangles, you can sort of make a good heuristic argument that, oh, probably it's better if your points are close to the boundary. Of course, you can also do the same problem on the torus where there is no boundary and then you would like see really nothing. Um, so I want to sort of, for the last part of the talk, you know, turn to this question of interpretability and maybe talk about a different problem. Uh, and this is a problem I've worked on a lot, you know, as a, pure mathematician, not with machine learning, and sort of tell you a little bit about this project with a different group of collaborators from DeepMind, uh, which is approaches us in a different way. So, uh, I mean, I'm, so just to, to recall this problem, um, and I'm going to stick to this case of uh, vector spaces over the finite field of three elements. And by a cap set, we just mean a set of vectors so that no three sum to zero. And in characteristic three, that's actually equivalent of no three being an arithmetic progression. So this sort of problem, which is kind of an old one, is something that's thought of as a model for the classical problem in, in number theory of large subsets of Z with no three terms in arithmetic progression. And this is kind of a finite field model for that problem. Um, so here's, uh, okay, here's Terry Tao's sort of favorite quote where he called this one of his favorite open questions and we'll just denote by f of n this the largest such a cap set can be um so let me just say i i, I think for this talk i don't want to go so much into the guts of this problem um but you can but the the point is that just by sort of taking cartesian products of known examples, you know, if you have an example in dimension four and another example of dimension four, you can put them together into an example of dimension eight. Uh, and that's enough to show you that f of n to the one over n approaches a limit. There's sort of some exponential base. Um, you know, when I worked on this problem a few years ago, like the, the what we were able to get was a better upper bound than three on order of 2.7. Um, the best lower bound is like on order 2.2 something. Um, so again, as with the isosceles problem, that's like a very big gap between the upper and lower bound. And again, in problems like this, where there's like a huge gap, that's where you're like, oh, maybe the machine can actually do something for us. But 
if we were to do, I mean, you can imagine some world where we work very hard and burn lots of compute and get a machine to make some large subset of, you know, an eight dimensional vector space over a Z3. And we would look at it and like, what would we gain? Maybe nothing. And maybe we would sort of have bragging rights that we made a big set, but you'd be looking at like a list of zeros, ones, and twos. And as mathematicians, that's not ultimately what we care about, right? We don't ultimately care about, did we find the biggest cap set of dimension eight? We care about whether we sort of understood something theoretically and getting better lower bounds is sort of a benchmark for whether we actually understood something. Um, so this question, I think by itself, maybe I don't care about so much because maybe we would have success, but the success wouldn't be success on our metrics. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what's in this paper um, that came out earlier this year um, about this problem. Um, because what we did is something, and look, I'm gonna say what we did. I'll be honest, this protocol was totally the idea of DeepMind. So I, I say that just so that I, I say it's a very cool idea. I'm not bragging on myself. I'm saying like they had a cool idea and brought me in to like be part of this project, um, which sounds kind of crazy at first, which is instead of searching subsets of the vector space over the finite field, you search the space of programs. What does that even mean? Like, how is that even a space? There's not like a topology on that space. Like, um, I'm going to tell, don't worry, I'm going to tell you what it means. But like, what you should think of it is like, um, there, there is some rather large set of short Python programs. Some of them will output a subset of Z mod 3Z to the N. And you might want to find one which outputs a subset of Z mod 3 to the N that's big and that doesn't have any three-term arithmetic progressions. The only question is, how would you find such a program? So let me tell you uh, this method of fern search. And I'm gonna and the entire thing is described in this cartoon. And I can promise you, I don't know if there's like machine learning specialists uh, in the audience, but I think most people in the audience are kind of more like me. I mean, obviously there's an incredibly huge, hideous mass of details of implementation that I'm completely hiding in this cartoon. But I think this cartoon is like very good for us. Um, so here's how it works. Um, you start on the left with a million Python programs. And then, and then uh, wh where do you get them? Like maybe they're like literally random. Okay, maybe not like random strings of letters because then none of them would run. Um, but you build them on some skeleton where they are, uh, where they're guaranteed to output a list of vectors. But beyond that, they're sort of generated randomly. Um, and then you run them all. And if it and if you get something where the set of vectors it outputs fails the test, like it has three and it has three in the arithmetic progression, you throw it out. Probably that's most of them. And then a lot of them just don't run. Um, and then you have some left. And then you see, okay, of the ones that passed the test and produced a cap set, which ones were biggest? And now you have a much smaller set of programs, let's say 100. And please don't worry too much about these exact numbers. This is a cartoon. Um, OK, you would expect, right, that even these 100 programs would not be very good. They were sort of picked as the best performers out of like a million programs that you produced without any forethought at all. Um, so then, and you also notice I have not mentioned any machine learning steps, right? So then the next step is you take those hundred programs and you have, as DeepMind does, like a sort of big, large language model that's trained on lots and lots of Python code. And then you say, okay, give me more like these. And you make a million more. Now you have a million new Python programs. Now it's still the case that a lot of these are not even gonna run. And of the ones that run, um, some of them won't produce a set with no three three term arithmetic progressions. Um, but you could imagine if you were a real optimist that because the large language model was trying to generate them to be like these 100 programs that did at least run and produce a cap set, maybe they'd be better than random. 
and then you run them all, you evaluate them, you sieve down to 100 again, and then you just keep doing this for a long, long, long time because you're a deep mind and you have like an unbelievable number of GPUs and you can just keep running them endlessly. Um, and I think the great miracle is that this actually kind of works. Um, I'm going to try to sort of tell you like in what ways it works and it, what ways it doesn't work. But I, I was not really convinced that this would work at all. And I thought it might output trash. Um, and actually this like rather simple approach of cartoon, which again, for the sort of uh, AI fans, it's certainly correct to say that this is sort of a form of genetic algorithm where you're sort of filtering by fitness and then sort of spawning new creatures that are somewhat like your old. I mean, the novel element is that the large language model sort of gives you like a very direct way. It's not so obvious, right, genetically, how you sort of mate two Python programs. Whereas large language models, which sort of are trained on tons and tons of code and are like very good at reeling out code, they're sort of exactly well adapted to do this kind of thing. And hopefully to sort of capture some features that we might not have seen. Um, so I just want to show you one of these pieces of code. Um, and this happens to be a piece of code, which uh, if you run it for n equals eight, gives like a very big cap set uh, in eight dimensions, bigger than any that was previously known. Um, I just put it up there because, you know, a lot of the role, a lot of my role in this collaboration as the pure mathematician who is familiar with this problem was like looking at code like this and trying to figure out what it was, so to speak, trying to do. And I'll just say, I mean, one thing I want to report on is that if you spend a lot of time staring at code produced by a large language model, um, I, you, you can't help it. You do kind of start to get a psychological feeling that it's trying to do something, maybe maybe something that it can't quite express. So I'm going to draw this connection between, you know, when I showed you this graph, that this, this colored four colored graph that my students made, you could look at it and see like, okay, it's trying to learn this linear, linear boundary. Let me help it along and just like assert that's the decision rule, this linear decision rule. I, here too, there are times where you look at the code and you're like, okay, it's trying to do something in a cumbersome way and we can rewrite it a little better and make it do something more, more cleanly. Um, so again, in the interest of time, let's, let's see which thing I have a lot of remarks in this and I'm happy to sort of hang around for as long as we want after and make them all. I think I won't make everything. Um, let me make a few comments. One, if you know anything about large language models, you know a big problem is that they hallucinate and just sort of say stuff that's not true. And one cool thing about this protocol is that because we have this evaluation mechanism that has nothing to do with a large language model and is completely objective and is also fast, um, that problem is not a problem for this method because it is certainly true. I mean, the, the, the hallucination in this context would mean you pass the large language model, a bunch of programs that actually do produce cap sets and say, make more like these. And it gives you some programs that don't produce cap sets. Okay, yes, that definitely happens. They definitely do hallucinate in that sense, but we don't care. We just throw them out and move on with our lives. So it would be as if, you know, if you were like trying to get an LLM to write sonnets for you, most of them would be pretty bad sonnets. And a lot of them like wouldn't even be sonnets. They wouldn't even obey the form. But if you had like a lightning fast and completely reliable sonnet evaluator so that you could like generate a million sonnets and just eliminate all the non-sonnets in an instant and then pick out the, the most sonnety sonnet of the ones that were left, then the hallucination wouldn't be a problem, right? And sonnets are not like that, but cap sets are. So that's one uh, reason that one of the big limitations of LLM is not such a limitation here. Um, the results are much more interpretable than lists of vectors. So again, um, when you look at a short chunk of Python code, um, you can hope that if it works well and gives a big cap set, maybe you can figure out why it gives a good cap set. Maybe there's something actually sort of to be learned by us. Um, so let me kind of, I, I have some more comments on this, but I want to sort of say a few things at the end. Um, let me kind of try to lay out this method, which is pretty different, which is a little bit different from the methods I was talking about at the beginning. Um, what it can certainly do, the big success was that for a given n, like eight, if you work really hard, you can get a program that outputs like a pretty big cap set. And in this case, 
a capsid of size 512, which is like a little bit bigger than the largest one previously seen, uh, which was like 496. Now, as mathematicians, as I said, we don't care so much about f of 8 in particular. And something that would be incredible and that I was pretty sure was not going to happen and indeed not did not happen is, I mean, imagine, actually, let me go back and show you that program. So this program just has an N in it, and then you run it for N equals 8. You could take a program that you trained on N equals 8 and say, now I'm going to run it on N equals 10 or N equals 20. And it would be incredible if it actually was a general program that worked. Okay, that doesn't happen. I, like that's If that had happened, that would be the whole talk, and I would be telling you about that, because that would be amazing. Um, but that uh, we did not see. And in fact, like, you know, again, what what is the role of a pure mathematician in a collaboration like this? For those of you who may be thinking about doing them, like one of them is that, you know, they can certainly train a program for n equals eight and then run it on not n equals nine and n equals 10 and be like, it doesn't seem to work that well. But what only we can do is actually look at the code and say like, okay, I can, I can tell you what the asymptotic performance would be as a function of n. And maybe, okay, just for the fans of additive number theory who like this problem, most of the programs that I was able to fully analyze their performance um, did not do well for large n and actually gave like constant times two to the n. So for those who are like fans of that problem, you know that there's a sort of a very easy two to the n construction and somehow most of the programs for large n are only constant better than that. Okay, so, so we get this and we don't get we don't get this. That would be like this incredible holy grail and that's something that hasn't been seen. But um, you know, as we come to the close, what I want to emphasize is that I think if if machine learning were only doing the first thing, we might not be so excited as mathematicians. And if it did the second thing, we might feel really threatened as mathematicians. <laughs> but I think there's something intermediate, which at least with the technology as it presently is, and maybe as it will be for the near term, uh, is both realistic and pretty exciting, which is a kind of intermediate goal where maybe the code doesn't work for a general N, but uh, but maybe we can get some, we, the human reader, can get some ideas from it that help us do better on the general end. And that's where interpretability is key. So did that happen with this problem? No, because if I had like a sort of really qualitatively new kind of lower bound for cap sets, again, I would be giving that talk and would tell you about it. But here, here's how far we got in this problem. I would say, I'm somebody who's thought about this problem a lot. And I would say it certainly happened several times that I would think through what the code was doing and I was like, okay, actually, now that I see the strategy, that gives me a thought for something to try. Now, none of those things worked, but I feel like, to me, an idea that seems interesting enough for somebody who's actually worked on the problem to be like, let me spend like three days to a week thinking this through and seeing if there's something there, that's already pretty good. Like we know that like most of the ideas that we have, like don't come to fruition. And I think if it's like, if it's giving me things that at least seem worth trying, that's already at a pretty high level. Um, I'll also comment that in another problem, which is sort of relegated to the appendix of this paper, um, we were trying to get it to learn the Shannon capacity of a graph, which is another famously hard problem in extremal combinatorics. Um, I'll just say in words what happened because I don't have a slide for this. Um, there was one really short program that gave a that gave a nice example of giving a bound for the Shannon capacity of the nine cycle. Don't even worry about what, if, either you know what Shannon capacity of graphs is or you don't. It doesn't matter. I'm just trying to make a sort of moral point. And in this case, the program was so short and so readable that I'm like, I really got to understand this one. And when I understood what it was doing, in that case, I was like, ah, I do actually see how to get a general bound using this technique. Now, why isn't my talk about that? Well, once I figured out the general bound, I was like, this has got to be known. It's like too straightforward. Uh, and then once I knew what to look for, then I found it in the literature. But I found it, you know, in a paper from like, you know, the 70s for a problem that was first stated in the 40s. So already, to me, that's like a great proof of concept that like, and, and I don't think it's because somehow this paper from a somewhat obscure combinatorics journal was like, scanned and interpreted in the training data. I think it, I, I do think somehow this came from from scratch. And so I feel like, okay, if, if we can get ideas that are like good enough for a paper published in the 70s, 
we will eventually, uh, and maybe even in the near term, be able to sort of get ideas that sort of help us do stuff that's uh, that's actually new. So I'm very high on this kind of red intermediate zone. This is where I see the sort of maximum current potential uh, for mathematical development from these kinds of methods. Um, and maybe I'll just go there. So we're, so we're near the end of our time. I have a I have, I have good friends in CS at Wisconsin who are like, yeah, but maybe your whole line of research in this is misguided because maybe, as you can see, what I'm talking about here, and by the way, there's so much I didn't talk about. I didn't talk about formalization, which is another really important direction where machine learning can touch math, but I haven't really done it yet. So um, everything I've talked about has been really kind of bespoke work where you have a mathematical problem you're trying to solve and you really work hard to sort of channel the machine to do something on this problem. And of course, there's a totally different way of thinking, which says, actually, you just train on everything in the world um, and you just um, and you just ask in English and expect the machine to respond like as a human would, except like a sort of human who uh, who sort of has perfect memory and sort of access to all the mathematical literature. Um, I'll just say that, I mean, having now played with this for about a week, um, I, contrary to sort of some other reports, I find the progress here like a little bit incremental and I have some just beginning to be formed thoughts about which kinds of mathematical capabilities uh, these new kind of chain of thought LLMs can produce and which ones they can't. Maybe I'll just say, without saying too much specific, that it really makes me feel like, how to say it, people naturally sort of look to a kind of linear ranking where they're like, well, what percentage of human mathematicians is this better than? Um, actually playing with this thing and getting a little dirty, um, I think that's very wrong. I think it's much more like a partial order where there's certain directions on which it's like quite good and human-like and even better than most humans, but other directions in which uh, it's much worse than any human. Um, and I think it's just not comparable. I think it's, I think the sort of, uh, in a way, just like a calculator, right? It's like much better than us on certain capabilities and worse than us at others. And this feels like that to me too, at least after a week of trying to get it to do stuff. Um, but I just wanted to bring it up just in case you're in the camp that feels like the first 50 minutes of the talk were like a dead end and this is the way to go. Uh, I'm not convinced of that at this moment, but it's certainly, uh, worth talking about. Okay. Uh, we're at 1054. So I'm going to stop there. I hope people will have questions because this is the thing I love talking about. And I'm just happy to sort of like hang out and hear what people have to say.